Welcome back. In this video, we're going to dig into Tresec a little bit more by focusing on how the SGTs are signed, how bindings are done, and delve into how they're passed through the network. Let's start by going over the SGT classification options. The first type would be dynamic. This is what you usually think of when you think of ICE. It uh, authenticates and authorizes the device at the time of connection as part of network access control, and it delivers a security group tag at that time. This is probably the best type of security group assignment. Um, in order to assign those tags, though, make sure that IP device tracking is turned on on the switch. ICE uses the, the Cisco AV pair CTS security group tag to deliver that tag as part of uh, with RADIUS. And if you wanted to view the binding, you could use the command show CTS roles based SGT map detail, all details. And you should be able to see that uh, in the output. The other way to assign a security group tag is statically. This is usually done for servers, topology based policy, or brownfield sites. Maybe you want to give a whole site a, that you're migrating over to TrustSec a certain security group tag. Overall, though, these are best used with hosts that aren't changing IP addresses regularly. Static tags can be assigned by IP address, subnet, VLAN, layer 2 interface, layer 3 interface, any of the above that I, I mentioned before in their own separate VRFs, or statically defined in ICE and pushed out via SXP peer. Don't worry about SXP right now, though. We'll go into it further down, further in this video. So let's talk about how bindings are done if we statically configured them. For a VLAN, what it would do is it would snoop our packets on the VLAN based on that static SGT mapping configured. The command that we would use to configure a static VLAN mapping would be CTS role-based SGT dash map VLAN, the VLAN number, SGT, and then the SGT number. We can also do a static IP address to SGT mapping. This would be done in the command line. The command that we would use to configure it would be CTS role dash base SGT dash map, the IP address, SGT, and then the SGT number. We can assign a whole subnet for static SGT assignment. The command that we would use for that is very similar to the IP to SGT static mapping. It would be CTS role dash base SGT dash map, the subnet, um, the actual subnet, and then slash the mask. So it would be slash like 28, for example, SGT, and then the SGT number that you'd want. For the layer 3 interfaces, we can assign an SGT tag statically. The bindings would be added due to the fib entries if they have a path through that interface. The command would be configured on the actual interface context, so we'd go to interface g slash 0 slash 1, and then configure it based off of, with the command cts role dash base sgt dash map sgt and then the sgt number. Alternatively, it also lets you do um, cts role dash base SGT dash map, security dash group, and then the security group tag name itself, if you wish. We can also configure a layer 2 interface for static tagging. This would be configured under the interface context again for that layer 2 interface, but it's slightly different than the actual layer 3 interface commands. So we would go to interface g slash 0 slash uh, 1. We would, to configure it manually, we would type first SGT manual, and we'd be in the SGT context. And then we'd assign it with the command policy static SGT, and then the SGT number. SXP is another way that the network access device could learn the bindings. They would learn this from other SXP peers that were configured to communicate this to the network access device. IP ARPs. This, these are the bindings that are learned through tagging ARP packets received on a Cisco TrustSec capable link. And the last is local. This is for dynamic security group tag assignment. Bindings of authenticated hosts that are learned via IP tra device tracking and assign the tag assigned by ICE. This type of binding includes hosts that were learned via ARP snooping on layer 3 ports as well. With all the different ways to learn IP to SGT mapping, what happens if an endpoint con con connects to the network and the network access device is configured with overlapping static and dynamic mappings? What then? 
Well, in that case, there's an SGT classification binding source priority that it kind of evaluates kind of an order of operations to determine which uh, IP to SGT mapping it should actually look at first and enforce based off of. The first thing that it looks at is internal, which is between locally configured IP addresses and the network device's own SGT. This has the first priority in terms of the binding source priority. The next thing it looks at is local. These are the authenticated hosts learned via EPN and device tracking. This also includes hosts learned via ARP snooping on layer two. So basically your, your dynamic tags that are assigned. The next thing that it will evaluate is if if it doesn't match the first two, is IP ARP, bindings that are learned when tagged, tagging ARP packets are received. After that, it'll be SXP, bindings from that SXP peer that's connected. Then layer three interfaces, bindings added from the FIB. Then static IP address or subnet bindings configured in the CLI. And last, VLAN bindings learned from snooped R packets when a VLAN SGT map has been configured. So basically a static, SG, uh, static SGT map for VLANs. Let's talk about where tagging exists in the packet itself. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up my whiteboard really quickly. In the top right corner here, I have a representation of a packet. So we have the IP header and then the layer two header itself inside the frame. So the it, Inside that layer two header, the SGT uh, uh, tag is actually using unused layer two header space. The tag itself is added to the header as part of inline propagation if your switch is configured for it. The tagging is done in hardware and requires a TrustSec capable device. The tag will continue to be passed along to the next device in the network path unless you specifically configure to basically that this is the end of the TrustSec boundary and to strip that tag. When the packet gets an enforcement point, that enforcement point compares the tag to the, its security group policy and makes a decision on what to do with it then. If you're living in a classic ACL world, this probably sounds a little strange to you. TrustSec kind of goes against what you're taught early on with uh, how you would put an ACL closest to the source instead of the destination. But with our networks being as uh, large as they are now, it's, you know, it's easier. And the fact that we, uh, the destination tag is essentially known where the egress point is, it's easier to actually enforce on the, the destination or the access layer of wherever it's going than to do it at the source. Since it is using uh, tr unused layer two space, it really doesn't affect the frame size greatly. At most from a layer two pr perspective, maybe 40 bytes. And since it's only layer two, it's, and it's stripped off at the layer three boundary, so the IPMTU for your layer three devices doesn't have to change. If a switcher device in the path though doesn't understand se what security group tags are, they will drop the frame unless you strip the SGT first. So how do we enforce our SGTs to work over pockets of non trustsec capable devices or layer three boundaries? SXP is the answer. So let's go over SXP really quickly. It's a control plane protocol. Um, I kind of liken it to BGP because it's essentially connects to a peer or neighbor that you define and it moves those IP to SGT routes or, or IP to SGP mappings of authenticated hosts to different points in the network. It utilizes TCP port 64999 by default. So if you have to configure SXP through a firewall, you wanna make sure that that's open, um, at least between the source and destination network device. And there are two roles that you can have with SXP. You can be a speaker, which is the initiator, um, like the one that's saying, hey, I have a binding for you know, 10.1.100.155, and then the listener that receives that. Some network devices can do both roles. They can be a speaker and a listener at the same time. And ICE can also communicate with those network devices as both a speaker and a listener. To visualize this a little bit better, let me go ahead and pull up my whiteboard once again. So let's say we have somebody, Diane from the uh, design department connect with her uh, computer and it's, her packets are tagged with an SGT tag of five from that switch. That switch moves that packet up to the router, which the router is configured to strip that packet as it goes through the WAN. So it strips the SGT tag and it, and, uh, it utilizes SXP to communicate, hey, when you get a, a packet from me that's uh, 
you know, you know, say it's IP address of 10.1.100.155, go ahead and tag that with an SGT tag of five. And at that point, once that, uh, once that packet hits out of the router, it will uh, go ahead and re-tag the packet and move it a a along its LAN. If you don't want to configure router to router, maybe it's a big private MPLS uh, uh, cloud and you want to instead have a centralized place to do those IP to S uh, SGT uh, mappings to be delivered through SXP, we can do something else. So we, what we can do is we can kind of have ICE serve as our head end for SXP. So let me go ahead and draw out ICE really quickly. So instead of that first router directly connecting to the other router it, for SXP, it would connect to ICE and then deliver that mapping to ICE. So 10.1.100.55 equaling SGT5 would be delivered to ICE, and then ICE would push that down via SXP as well to that second router. And it makes it just a little bit easier to have that kind of push there so you're not having to kind of design and architect around direct connections if you wanted to do it this way instead. Either way you configure it, the security group tag would be re-tagged re on the packet and the access layer switch would be making a decision based off the security group policy which is pushed to it by ICE. And with that, that ends our second TrustSec video and I hope you've enjoyed it.